Good evening. I am Brooke Clement, and it is my pleasure as Acting Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum to welcome you to this evening's author talk. Catherine Grace Katz joins us tonight as part of our celebration of Women's History Month to discuss her book, The Daughters of Yalta. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to highlight a few programs we will have later on this month. On March 18th, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, Library and Museum, along with the Hohenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University will be hosting David Eisenhower. The talk will honor Ralph Hohenstein on what would have been his 109th birthday. Mr. Eisenhower will also share stories about his grandfather and relate his insights into Ralph's work in intelligence during World War II. On March 31st, we are collaborating with the White House Historical Society presenting Exploring the White House Easter Egg Roll, a family learn along. This program will cover the evolution of the White House Easter Egg Roll from the chaotic scene of kids racing around the lawn of the Capitol building to a highly organized affair. You can register online for both of these vir virtual events. Now onto tonight's program. In addition to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, we would also like to thank the National Archives Foundation and Maggie and Robert Orugerde for their support of this virtual event. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to remind you we will be taking questions from the audience, so feel free to submit yours during the program. Public Affairs Specialist Kristen Mooney will be incorporating those questions into tonight's discussion. Catherine Grace Katz is a writer and historian from Chicago. She graduated from Harvard in 2013 with a BA in history and received her master in philosophy in modern European history from Christ's College, Cambridge in 2014, where she wrote her dissertation on the origins of modern counterintelligence practices. After graduating, Catherine worked in finance in New York City before returning to history and writing. She is currently pursuing her JD at Harvard Law School. The Daughters of Yalta is her first book. Please join me in welcoming Catherine and Kristen to our virtual stage. Thank you, Brooke. Well, Catherine, I'm so excited to be here with you this evening. Um, I truly enjoyed reading um, your book. It read like a novel, but was full of factual history. So kudos. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's so much fun to join you, and uh, I, we're uh, it's a fun evening to be doing this uh, as well. It's it's you know, not only Women's History Month, but tomorrow is also the 75th anniversary of Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. Uh, so uh, definitely, it feels like a a perfect time to have a chat about uh, these subjects. <laughs> it is. Um, I'm so glad it worked out. Well, for those of us who haven't really studied Yalta recently and might need a bit of a refresher, do you want to just talk a bit about the history? History, why the the area was selected? Um, just just give us the background. Absolutely. Um, the Yalta Conference is something that I think people remember often from uh, from you know, U.S. history or you know, reading your favorite book about World War II. But it's also something that's often kind of just. Uh, glossed over at the end, you know, as either the teacher realizes, you know, there's two weeks left in the semester and they still have 75 years of history to get through. So it's kind of like, you know, and then we have the Yalta Conference and then the, uh, they dropped the bomb and then the war ended. Um, similarly, I think it often comes at the end of books where you know, an editor is saying, you, know, you got to cut your page limit. And so it's kind of sped through really quickly. Um, but it's a, a fascinating moment in time. And it's kind of right on the precipice now that we see it uh, from with the gift of hindsight on the precipice between World War and Cold War. The Yalta Conference uh, occurred in February 1945. And at that point in the war, the Battle of the Bulge in Europe uh, had just ended. Uh, the race is now on to see which allied army will be the first to liberate Berlin. Meanwhile, the war in the Pacific has not advanced quite as far. Um, and I love to almost you know, start with that really famous photograph of the Yalta Conference, which is one that I think is very familiar to people. Um, because I do think it's very enlightening to see kind of in the moment, you know, these leaders, the, the look on their faces, which is very grim and very determined. You can see them in the courtyard of Lavadia Palace with their military advisors behind them. And you can get a sense of the weight of the world on their shoulders. They've come to discuss issues. Uh, there are kind of four that I think of uh, primarily. Uh, one being uh, the future of Germany. Should Germany be allowed to remain one nation or should it be broken up into smaller states in hopes that they can't rise up as a belligerent for a third time in a century? Very important to Churchill is the, the future of Poland and Polish sovereignty. 
Britain had gone to war in defense of Polish sovereignty at the outset, and he doesn't now want to you know, end the war, not being able to guarantee that which they went to defend. Meanwhile, Stalin has other objectives and designs in Eastern Europe, especially Poland. The Soviet Union has been invaded multiple times in history uh, through the flatlands of Poland, dating back to the Napoleonic era. And he wants to make sure that after all the sacrifices that the Soviet Union has made fighting the war, that they'll have friendly neighbors on their borders when it's all over. And of course, the Red Army has boots on the ground everywhere across the region. Roosevelt is oriented more towards the Pacific, looking at, uh, he wants to you know, save as many American lives as possible. He doesn't yet know if the Manhattan Project will be a success. He uh, is also, you know, the, the Iwo Jima has not yet happened. That's uh, the week after Yalta. So he's looking at the potential for the ground invasion of the Japanese home islands, which could lead to the deaths of 200,000 American soldiers. To minimize as many casualties as possible, he wants to uh, bring the Soviet Union into the fight to have them break their pact of neutrality with Japan in exchange for territorial concessions. And finally, he has a very personal goal as well, and that is to uh, succeed where Woodrow Wilson failed at the end of World War I with the creation of a new international peace organization of United Nations. Um, he also sees this as a way of bringing the Soviet Union into the international community after the war is over. Um, and so those are a few of their primary objectives as they're arriving at the Yalta conference. And then um, how, how was this area selected? I mean, I, I know that in the book, you go into a little detail as to it, it's not just as easy as, oh yeah, we'll just, Pick a spot here. <laughs> yes. So at this point in the war, uh, Stalin recognizes that he holds more cards than do his allies. The British Empire is significantly weaker now than they were at the beginning of the war, uh, and the uh, and the allies, you know, the Western allies, know they need Soviet cooperation on areas where Stalin doesn't necessarily have to budge. Things like you know, uh, free elections in Poland and joining the war in the Pacific. Stalin, meanwhile, is paranoid about security and he refuses to leave his own borders. He doesn't want to leave his security apparatus. He claims, however, that it's because his doctors have advised him against traveling because it's bad for his health. Meanwhile, Roosevelt's actually dying of congestive heart failure, though no one knows this. Uh, so Churchill and Roosevelt agreed to make this arduous journey all the way to the Crimea. Uh, some people may be familiar with Churchill's quip, if we'd spent 10 years looking for a worse location, we couldn't have found one. Uh, it really is kind of the best of many bad options. It's um, There's a, a map uh, that you can see just kind of, of just how... Uh, far it was and how grueling of a journey Churchill's flying first 1300 miles uh, to Malta where he'll rendezvous with FDR and on the way to Malta one of the uh, planes carrying the British delegates goes down off the coast of Italy several members of the foreign office are killed as it really cast a shadow over the start of the conference for the Brits Meanwhile, Roosevelt has to make a week-long journey uh, by ship across the Atlantic Ocean, where they're still sighting enemy U-boats. Um, they then rendezvous at Malta, which has led to the apocryphal Stalin quip, I said Yalta, not Malta. And then they fly a further almost 1,400 miles to the Crimea, uh, which, you know, of course, has been in the news more in recent years as well. But to get there, they fly in unpressurized planes at low altitude over islands where there are still enemy aircraft units. And then they have to drive once they land in the Crimea at a, an airfield that is dangerously short for the type of planes they're flying. Another six hours over battle scarred roads, sometimes at no more than 20 miles an hour uh, to finally arrive at Lavadia Palace. So you think of the kinds of preparations that go into security uh, for the kinds of conferences of this nature that take place today. No security team would allow their principals, you know, no president, prime minister to make this kind of journey, which was at you know, immense personal danger to each of them. And then once they arrive, it certainly is not glamorous conditions. Uh, Lavadia Palace was the summer home of Tsar Nicholas II and his family, kind of their retreat away from the pressures of court life. But it, you know, this is kind of a glamorous facade that is covering up for something much more stark uh, on the inside. After the Russian Revolution, Lavadia Palace was nationalized, turned into a rest home for Soviet workers. Then when the Nazis invaded the Crimea, they used Lavadia Palace as their Crimean headquarters. And when the Soviets pushed them out just months before the Yalta conference began, they stripped the palace of everything they could carry, all of the furniture, the lamps, the art, the dishes, literally down to the doorknobs, which they could strip from the doors and melt down and use as scrap metal. So the Soviets do what the Soviets do best, and that's throw manpower at the situation. And uh, once they the three delegations agree on where they're gonna meet, it's only three weeks prior to the conference is set to begin. 
And so the Soviets have just three weeks to turn this ransacked palace into a site fit for this type of event. So they take the contents of glamorous hotels in Moscow, like hotel, the Hotel Metropole, and cart that a uh, thousand miles south, uh, put it on trains, and you know they've restocked the villa with the the, uh, the hotel linens and china. And what they can't get that way, they just requisition out of the local homes of people whose lives have been summarily destroyed by the fighting that's taken place across the Crimea. So it's kind of one of those things where what appears on the surface is not the reality. If you peek behind the curtain, the palace is covered in bed bugs. The naval advance team comes in and douses everything in DDT, which we <laughs> now know has its own <laughs> risks associated. <laughs> this is certainly not the type of glamorous international affair that you associate with summetry today. Well, let's talk about the participants then. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, hearing about each each woman in her own right. Let's start with um, Sarah Churchill and talk a bit about her relationship with her father. Um, I know you go into to more detail in the book, so I, I, we can just touch base on it, but they had a very good connection with Brick Lane. They did, yes. Um, they uh, So Sarah and her father were very close from the time that she was a little girl. She was the middle of the, the Churchill's children, um, uh, the middle daughter. Uh, there were five of them uh, initially. Her younger sister Marigold died at, uh, died at age two. Um, so she was the third of their, their five children. And she said that from an early age, she felt that she understood the way her father's mind worked, that he could, she could walk with him in silent step. Uh, even if he wasn't speaking, she knew what he was thinking. And a lot of this came from uh, her experience with him uh, in the garden, spending long hours while he was engaged in his favorite pastime for relaxation, which was bricklaying. And uh, so they, they formed a very close bond that way. She also had a lot of her father's spirit she really wanted to carve out a name for herself on her own terms. So in an era where it was not expected or encouraged for women of her station to have a career, uh, she sought out a career as an actress and a dancer uh, to, to some success. And people today will remember her for having starred in a movie opposite Fred Astaire in 1951 called Royal Wedding. But what I think is so fascinating about her is that she really had so many of her father's gifts and an astute political mind, a deep grasp of politics, both foreign and domestic. She was a beautiful writer and had a lot of her father's gift of language. And so when the Churchills, uh, so early in the war, the Churchills decided that when Winston traveled abroad, someone from the family should go with him as a, a confidant and protector, uh, but also as a, an unofficial historian of sorts to help him write his war memoirs later. And so given her uh, many, uh, gifts you know as an actress you know, acting and diplomacy have a lot in common her her uh, way with words and also her experience as a member of the women's uh, branch of the royal air force during the war she had left her career as an actress aside to to join the fight she was an intelligence analyst making uh, intel assessments based on recon photos in support of allied operations especially in the mediterranean and she knew these details of the operation sometimes even better than her father did um, much to his great pride and amusement and so it's just you know, it's really sweet to look at some of the photographs of them you know at this you know when she was a little girl starting with um you can see her here you know as a bricklaying assistant uh a young girl <laughs> there in the garden with her father and then you know this glamorous young woman who grows up uh, to to serve her country and play such an enormous role in her father's life during the war. And you kind of have a personal connection with a photograph of her um, from family trips, right? Yes, I do. Um, so my family, uh, I kind of got to know Sarah in an unusual, unusual way of sorts. Um, my family visits the cloister at Sea Island, Georgia every summer. You know, we've been going there since I was a baby. And there on the wall is this very beautiful picture of Sarah from her wedding day. She had eloped to Sea Island with her second husband, Anthony Beecham, in 1949, causing quite a scandal. And I'd walked past this photograph of her since I was a little girl and always admired it and didn't know that I would someday be <laughs> writing this book about her and having the opportunity to be the first person to go through her papers uh, when the family opened them to outside researchers for the first time. It's always nice to have a personal connection to your subject and, and, and the book. So um, let's move on to Kathleen Harriman and Averill. Um, I really appreciated how he came back into their, the, his daughter's lives after um, their mother passed away, but offered them 
a, a trip into the man's world, so to speak, if they wanted to come and join him. And, and he offered parenting as best he could. <laughs> yes, he was not a warm and fuzzy parent by any means. Uh, I think some of the, those uh, aspects of not being a warm and fuzzy parent also probably uh, didn't serve him as well later when he entered you know, politics in a more elected capacity. People remember him as a governor of New York and one time presidential candidate. Uh, but glad handing, glad handing, kissing babies was not necessarily his forte. <laughs> and you can see that in his role as a father as well. Uh, he's one of the, the, the most important figures of the 20th century that I think people today don't learn as much about as they should. He had been the chairman of Union Pacific Railroad, uh, founded Brown Brothers Harem and the banking firm, owned Newsweek magazine, shipping conglomerates, you know, businesses all around the world. And he was also the founder of Sun Valley, uh, the first glamorous American ski resort, which he had created to encourage people to use his train lines and take them out west. And he did not have a close relationship with his daughters when they were young. He had two daughters, Mary and Kathleen. They were very close in age. And he and his wife had divorced when they were little girls. Uh, but after their mother died, when uh, Kathleen was a teenager, Averill did very much come back into their lives and said uh, in a way that was very ahead of his time for uh, the, <laughs> he said, I, uh, I can't be the warm and fuzzy father that you know, many could be, but I'd like to offer you something different. And that's a chance to be the best and finest of friends and for you to be involved in my work and my professional life to the extent that it interests you. Kathleen Harriman was a high school student at the time about to go to Bennington College. And this is something she really saw as the opportunity of a lifetime. So she spent her college vacations with him in Sun Valley she became a world-class skier, uh, an Olympic level skier, was an alternate for the what became the canceled 1940 Olympics, but also built this friendship with her father. And uh, it would become kind of the basis of what would be their relationship for the next five years. He became the Lend-Lease envoy uh, in London uh, through, uh, he had joined the New Deal administration in the 1930s at the urging of his sister, Mary Harriman Rumsey, became good friends with Harry Hopkins. And then FDR appointed him to oversee land lease before the United States entered the war. He arrived there in the middle of the Blitz in early 1941 and thought, gosh, this would be a great opportunity for my 23-year-old daughter to come join me as London is being bombed nightly and work <laughs> as a war reporter. So Kathleen uh, followed him to London, became a war reporter, and uh, she and her father became very close with the Churchill family. Um, they were so close, in fact, that they were celebrating Kathleen's 24th birthday the night that they all learned the news about Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, which is remarkable. And then Kathleen decides to stay with him in 1943 when he becomes the ambassador to the Soviet Union, learns to speak Russian for both of them, knowing he wouldn't have time, and really becomes in many ways like his assistant ambassador and uh, had more access to and experience with Stalin and his inner circle than any other American woman in history, which is just absolutely fascinating when you think about, you know, I was 27 years old as I was working on this, Kathleen was 27 at Yalta, and just to put myself in her shoes, uh, it was just really quite astounding. And again, I have a couple of pictures to show. Uh, here's Avril Harriman looking glamorous on the slopes in Sun Valley. Uh, and a picture of Kathleen here with a, a horse that was gifted to her by Joseph Stalin in recognition of uh, her years with her father in Moscow during the war. Very nice, very nice. It's just, it is amazing when you look at all the opportunities afforded to each of these, these individuals. It's, it's a remarkable story that you tell. Um, Anna Roosevelt, though, has a bit different take on all of this. She, like you alluded to earlier, is there kind of as her father's protector, um, making sure he makes it through the conference um, and everything. Yes, the, the stakes are higher for Anna than for anyone else because uh, she's there at the conference keeping a deadly secret for her father and literally keeping him alive. And that's you know the, the secret that he's dying of congestive heart failure for which there was no cure at the time. Anna and her father have a really interesting relationship. You think of FDR as being very much you know, the champion of women, and very progressive, and in many ways he and Eleanor were, but not necessarily always when it came to their daughter. Anna was the oldest of their five children and the only daughter. And she and, and uh, Franklin were very close when she was a little girl. They had a shared passion for the, the natural world and the environment. But this all changed when he uh, was paralyzed uh, after his polio diagnosis and Anna really found herself at arm's length from him you know, where he was always then surrounded by doctors and his political colleagues who then needed to come to him. Her parents expected her to, to go to finishing school, become a debutante, 
something that she resisted. Uh, she felt she was being forced into this life, which she knew that they ridiculed uh, and didn't understand why they insisted that she be part of it. She spent a little bit of time at Cornell before leaving uh, to make a rebellious marriage at age 20. She had two children. The marriage sadly broke down and she uh, remarried after falling in love with a Republican journalist on her father's campaign trail. So thinking about, you know, people crossing the political divide today, that was definitely <laughs> an extreme case of it then. Uh, and her husband was, uh, John Bodiger was uh, an employee of William Randolph Hearst, who was one of FDR's chief critics. Uh, she and her husband became the joint editors of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer newspaper. Uh, and when her husband joined the army in 1943, she decided to move back home to her family and home, of course, then being the White House. Uh, and when she arrived there, after not seeing her father for some time, she noticed that something about him was very different. Uh, she, he was staring off in space, you know, with his mouth hanging open, almost as if he couldn't get enough air to breathe. He was not, not as sharp on the details, the quick recall that she knew. Uh, but Eleanor, you know, perhaps because she saw him every day, really didn't notice a, a difference. But Anna was very alarmed and insisted that he have a comprehensive medical examination, which revealed he was, in fact, dying of congestive heart failure. Anna and the doctor are the only people who know. They're sworn to secrecy. And FDR, curiously, never asks what's wrong with him. You can imagine you know, being a wartime president, your sole focus is leading the country through the war. And perhaps you, know, you can see why he wouldn't want to know a, a dire diagnosis. So Anna really takes it upon herself to become his gatekeeper at the White House, adjusting his diet, making sure he eats better, trying to get him to rest as much of a war, as a wartime president can and also helping to determine who really needs a meeting with the president, who can meet with someone else. Uh, sometimes even going so far as to take papers out of his inbox at night and distributing them to others who can handle them. She had re remembered the close relationship she had with her dad as a little girl and wanted to recapture that and hoped that she would be asked to join him on one of his overseas trips. Uh, but he'd always turned to one of his sons instead, seeking them for their, you know, their ability to help him physically, to, to stand and to move. And instead, uh, you know, Eleanor and Anna kind of communicated between themselves, talking about how Franklin sometimes seems to think that, you know, women should stay home and keep the home fires burning, which, you know, again, you're not thinking of FDR in that way. Yeah. But this changes in 1945 when he clearly knows that something is wrong with him and that Anna's protecting him. He cables Churchill and says, if you're thinking of bringing Sarah to this conference again, she had first joined him at the Tehran conference in 1943. Uh, I'm thinking of bringing my daughter Anna this time. So Anna has her, her chance finally to be at his side, to be invaluable to him. But she knows it's probably his last chance, which is just absolutely tragic. And uh, again, I'll, I'll share a picture quickly, uh, which I think is just you know one that's so charming of uh, them when Anna is a little girl and it's so rare to see him standing in a photograph. Uh, this is them at their, their home in mm -hmm. Campobello. And this is Anna uh, with her family uh, around the time uh, that she moved back to the White House. Um, she was the oldest of the three daughters at 38, and she was the only mother. Kathleen was 27, Sarah was 30. Um, and even though she was the oldest daughter, Anna was really kind of coming into this, the least experienced of the three. Uh, and I think she had felt sometimes a lack of self-confidence knowing that the other two daughters had been in the mix for much longer than she had. And I want to remind everyone, if you've got questions at home, feel free to um, start putting those in. We're going to start incorporating them into the discussion. Um, but, but talking about this daughter diplomat role, um, I mean, people have used family members, obviously, before in the past. So this isn't anything new. But they, they're not, they are given leeway to do things that traditional dip diplomats are not, correct? Right. It's different than how other first children had been used in the past. Um, there's been a long tradition of having, uh, especially um, first sons involved in, uh, in a way, in a uh, presidential administration dating back to the John Quincy Adams administration when his son was a, a principal private secretary. And so often you do see first children in that more kind of secretary scheduling, organizing type of role, but not so much as kind of being the aide de camp at a grand conference. And you, you know, it had uh, other, you know, Alice uh, Roosevelt Longworth, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's daughter was, she was an, a known figure in Washington, D.C. You know, you've had first daughters fill in for their mothers as kind of the um, acting first lady sometimes, or if, you know, there, there was no, no first lady to have a daughter serve. But this was very different. Uh, and in the case of Sarah Churchill, she is a, a military officer. She has technical understanding of the war. Kathleen's speaking Russian. She's the liaison between the Soviets and the Americans. 
as they're uh, laying the preparations for the conference, making sure that it's accessible for Roosevelt in his wheelchair. She's writing briefing material to help the Americans kind of cross the cultural divide coming into the Soviet Union. Uh, so, you know, like we think of a, a protocol officer in the State Department today. And uh, so the daughters, I, I do think of them as daughter diplomats, where they're there kind of in a quasi official capacity, where it's not the same as, you know, a uh, State Department or foreign expert kind of advising on policy. They're not in the conference room with their fathers negotiating with Stalin. They don't have the security clearance for that. It wouldn't be appropriate for them to be there. But that's not to say that they aren't very important and influential. So in their kind of quasi-official capacity, they're able to go and have conversations with people that others might not be able to have, you know, because it would appear, you know, that the government is saying something controversial or to you know, be able to report back to their fathers about what other people were saying and even go out into the local community and meet people in Yalta and the surrounding towns whose futures are literally being reordered by the conversations their fathers are having around the conference table. Each daughter's role is a little bit different. The way that they counsel their father is different. Sarah is almost kind of like a a conscience and a privy counselor to her dad, to, to Winston, late at night at two o'clock in the morning as he's expressing his frustration with Roosevelt, who just doesn't seem to understand the importance of making sure that Poland has free and unfettered elections. Uh, Anna trying to keep people from uh, going into FDR's room to meet with him, including Churchill. She's really kind of holding Churchill at arm's length, knowing he'll exhaust her father. Uh, and so very active roles. And, and that was a, a thing. I mean, you go into detail in that, that Churchill was hurt by FDR's ab ab abrupt approach. Um, and, and they didn't understand what really was going on. Exactly. Uh, Sarah Churchill had met FDR in 1943 when she served as her father's aide de camp first at the Tehran conference. And she noticed then what a warm and genuine friendship that they had for each other. And that friendship between Churchill and FDR was really the bedrock of the special relationship. And she feels so by early 1945 as she sees him again for the first time at Malta, where they, they meet for the final leg of the journey to Yalta. And she suddenly notices that something is different. And she says to her mother in a letter, is it his health or has he moved away from us? And she's actually you know, very appreciative. It's both. He, he is dying. Um, and so there, you know, Churchill, for all of his great intentions and great leadership, is you know can be an enervating, exhausting individual. Um, not that he's not correct, but you, know, you can see how for someone who has limited energy that that is a lot. Um, and so she can sense that something about them has changed and it's very frustrating to Churchill to see Roosevelt kind of pulling away from him and trying to then build this bond with Stalin on the basis of personal friendship, much like Churchill and FDR did, but deliberately leaving Churchill out of those conversations. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, looking at, at the daughters and um, their, their roles as journalism, seems to have, and, and you know, that, that seems to have a strong sense in each of these women, they're very smart. Um, do you think that that plays a role in their interpersonal relationships, you know, with talking to people, acting as those daughter diplomats? Absolutely. Um, Kathleen Harriman had been really in the mix of kind of the, the heights of power since 1941, the summer of 41, when she comes to join her dad. She is working as a, a war reporter and one of her assignments, uh, first thing she gets, you know, kind of human interest fluff stories like girls cheery song helps to cheer lift Londoners spirits. Uh, but she fights for, for more uh, media assignments and she ends up covering the conferences of the exiled leaders from Eastern Europe, especially the Polish government in exile. So, you know, they're giving press conferences, she's the reporter covering them. And so she hears as early as, you know, June 1941, when the British and the Soviets form an alliance um, after the, uh, the Nazis break their pact with the Soviets. And she's hearing the Polish government saying, you, you can't trust Stalin. It's not like dealing with another war leader. Meanwhile, people like her father are still thinking that I've done business in the Soviet Union. This will be like doing business anywhere else. You know, people can do mm -hmm. business and cross divides that they might not otherwise be able to. And it's not until he becomes ambassador and he sees firsthand the results of uh, the Soviets kind of quashing the Polish uprising, the Warsaw uprising in 1944, that his daughter was right and really had the right take on Stalin and his intentions uh, much earlier than he did, which is really fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. One um, of our audience members asked, how, how long after Yalta did FDR pass away? Do you recall? 
Yes, uh, so he died just eight weeks after the Yalta Conference, uh, April 12th, 1945, um, as he is, uh, he's in Warm, uh, Warm Springs, Georgia at the time. He is, uh, he's usually, you know, when he comes back from one of his, his overseas meetings, he is very tired and it takes him a bit of time to recuperate. Um, and he makes a, a joint address to Congress on, on March 1st, which he does seated for the first time. And you can really see how exhausted he is by this, this Herculean journey. Um, and so he's still, you know, thinking that it, by May, he'll be going to San Francisco for the first meeting of the United Nations. Um, and his mind is very much to the future, but it, it's just remarkable to think how close to the Yalta Conference that it was that he passed away. You know, his daughter, you know, there is room to say maybe shouldn't she shouldn't have been so actively kind of managing people, keeping Churchill from her father. But if she hadn't been doing that, you know, it's very possible he may have died at Yalta. Yeah, very true. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. And because you, and I don't want to give this away because I do want, I, I recommend this part of the book. There is a lot of underlying relationships that are going on at Yalta as well, a little behind the scenes. Do you want to talk a bit about those? <laughs> sure. Uh, so there, there are two kind of under underlying currents running through this. And I think people think of the Yalta conference as this you know, very impersonal geopolitical summit, but really all history, including the most, you know, the highest heights of summitry, they are, it's about personal relationships, you know, relationships between countries, between leaders. And, you know, you can also see just how, how personal it is to each of the participants as well. Um, so one of the things that's running kind of the underlying current is uh, espionage. Um, the Soviets have a far better system of espionage than we did uh, against them at the time. The Brits had even gone so far as to pull their spies out of Moscow after they uh, formed an alliance in 1941, saying that you know, friends don't spy on each other. And we had lost 20 years of knowledge about the Soviet Union after severing diplomatic relations with them after the Russian Revolution. So we're really behind the ball compared to them. Meanwhile, they've bugged the palaces. Uh, they've even bugged the gardens where the uh, diplomats think that they'll be able to have private conversations. Soviets have gone so far as to uh, trim certain paths in the garden to make it more accessible for Roosevelt and his wheelchair. So they had well. time to do all of that while yes. rebuilding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so they're like literally placing bugs in the garden. Um, they send doctors to the airfield to see if the rumors about Roosevelt being in ill health are true. And they're kind of there in the background incognito. And they also have a man on the inside uh, in, as a member of the State Department team that's there. And that's Alger Hiss, uh, who would become notorious just a few years later when he's brought to trial uh, for having been a spy, but nobody knows it yet. And in fact, the one warning that had been made about him uh, in the early 1940s, he kind of fell on deaf ears and never got passed up the chain of command. So he's right there in the conference meetings, kind of has Roosevelt's confidence. The other theme that is underlying this is romance. Um, there were, of course, you know, many notorious affairs that took place during the war, um, kind of this heightened tension of the wartime world. No one knew if they would have a tomorrow. And one of these is, of course, between Churchill's daughter-in-law, Pamela, and Avril Harriman. Uh, Kathy Harriman arrives in the summer of 1941, becomes best friends with Pamela Churchill, who's two years younger than she is, but soon she realizes that her father is also very friendly with Pamela and that they are, in fact, having an affair. It's kind of an open secret, uh, but he's not the only one that Pamela's having an affair with. Uh, she is seeing Edward R. Murrow, the famous CBS journalist, This is London. Uh, as well as a few other Yalta conference participants, including Fred Anderson, who's one of the uh, uh, US Army Air Force uh, representatives, and Peter Portal, who's the head of the British Royal Air Force, is utterly besotted with her. And he is writing to her throughout the, the duration of the conference, writes a 30-page handwritten letter to Pamela about you know, all the details of what he's seeing and doing, and then wants to hand deliver it to her when he returns to London for a chance to see her. <laughs> the benefit of this to we historians is these love letters to Pamela. Now we have 30 page you know, odes to Remember her what with, done. with all these details about Yalta, which then were hand delivered. So they did not go through the censor. Uh, so thank you for Pamela's affairs that we now have these unchopped up documents <laughs> with all this great information. Uh, but other people were having affairs. Sarah Churchill was a uh, separated from her husband at the time. Uh, he was an actor who was a good bit older than she was, and they decided not to divorce yet to uh, kind of save face for, for Winston. 
Um, but she was in love with the American ambassador to Britain, John Gilbert Winant, who was back in London. Um, Kathleen Harriman had had a very brief fling during her time in London with FDR Jr. Uh, one weekend that he was in London. So it kind of sometimes seems to me that uh, the only person not having an affair was Winston Churchill. Um, <laughs> FDR having an affair with Lucy Mercer, which Anna knows, and it's another key secret that she's keeping from her mother. So the, the interpersonal and the political are intimately intertwined. And Churchill was very devoted to his wife, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He and Clementine, uh, they're kind of the, the ultimate political power couple. Uh, he really relied on her counsel, judgment, uh, opinion as he was forming his opinions. She'd help him channel his you know, expansive thoughts into the most productive line of conversation. And he really valued her for that role that she played, uh, much as he also valued his daughters. Uh, his, his wife and daughters were a huge part of his public life and his political success. And he really appreciated them for that. That's lovely. Um, some questions are coming in. Um, what was your motivation for writing this book? So this book, it really kind of, uh, I feel like in a way it found me. I definitely did not set out to write a book about the Yalta Conference. Um, it wasn't something that was my you know, one of my favorite moments of history from school, but I'd always loved history, especially uh, the Second World War. I'd grown up loving movies like the like White Christmas and The Sound of Music and The Great Escape. And uh, I would read a ton. My mom would always read to us before bed. Uh, in the summer, we'd read on the porch. And so, you know, reading and writing, it was always part of my life. And I knew I wanted to be a writer. I just didn't think I'd be able to do it until I was much older. I'd studied history at Harvard um, and actually kind of accidentally spent a lot of time studying Churchill for my thesis. I was looking at British prisoner of war escape narratives inspired by my love of the, the movie, The Great Escape, and didn't realize that Churchill had written the first of what we think of as these uh, POW escape stories. Uh, about his own escape from a POW camp during the Boer War when he was just 24 years old. And it was the story of his escape which rocketed him to fame in England and launched his political career. I studied history at Cambridge uh, as a graduate student as well. And again, kind of accidentally spent a lot of time with Churchill when I was looking at uh, modern counterintelligence practices uh, during World War I, which Churchill oversaw as home secretary. And then I did what many you know, recent graduates think of as the smart thing. I went to work in finance in New York and uh, by sheer coincidence in the lobby of my office was a bookstore called Chartwell Booksellers named after Churchill's country home, which specialized in books by and about Winston Churchill. And um, I would go into this bookstore all the time, kind of saying I was gonna go down to the lobby and get a coffee, but really just needing a break from the Excel modeling, wanted to be engaged with history again. And through the owner of the bookstore, I met the International Churchill Society and the Churchill family. And they were uh, soon thereafter opening uh, Churchill's daughter's papers to researchers for the first time and asked if I'd be interested in writing an article about them. And of course I said, yes, you know, having had this, this childhood memory of seeing Sarah's picture, it felt very fortuitous. And as soon as I, I got into her papers, I realized there was this amazing story, you know, not just about her, but also about the two daughters at the Yalta conference. And uh, it really felt in many ways that they found me. Um, I thought I was going to go to you know, leave finance and go to law school, ended up getting into law school right when all this started, deferring for two years, finishing the book during my first year. Um, but it was really a wonderful journey of, of writing this book uh, about these three women who had been at the forefront of history who were about my age and just trying to think of what it would be like to, to be there, uh, giving a toast in Russian uh, to Stalin, like what Kathy Harriman was uh, called upon to do. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's really, you know, it was a very personally moving experience as well, also getting to know the three families uh, of these, these women. Wonderful. Um, I've got another question here from Michelle, and she said she enjoyed the book. Actually, she loved the book. And <laughs> you. can you discuss what prompted FDR to cut Harriman out of much of the conference? So by winter of 1945, Harriman and FDR have diverged in their view of the Soviet Union and their willingness to keep their promises. Harriman has become very disillusioned, especially after the Warsaw Uprising in 1944, when the Soviet Union was steps away from, you know, being able to back up this, um, the resistance movement that were trying to overthrow the Nazis, where they had a win of opportunity to do so, and so it's just sat on the other side of the river and let them get slaughtered. Um, he starts to realize then that, you know, there, there is going to be a very different way of needing to deal with the Soviets from there on out. 
that they're not likely to keep their promises and it has to be much more of a real politic type of way of working with them. Roosevelt, meanwhile, is still has the idea that he can forge a personal bond with Stalin that can transcend some of that. Um, encouraged by his success of kind of touchy-feely politics, as he called it, uh, in domestic policy and his friendship with Churchill. And so, you know, FDR and Harry Hopkins just kind of are not of the same mindset as FDR is at the time. So Harriman's kind of getting sidelined somewhat because he is, sees the relationship with Stalin much more like Churchill sees the relationship with Stalin where he doesn't trust him, uh, despite some of Churchill's outward signaling uh, comments like, if only I could dine with Stalin once a week, there'd be no problem, which is, you have to kind of take that somewhat with a grain of salt. And so, you know, he really has had a, a hugely frustrating last six months of dealing with FDR, who kind of refuses to grapple with the issue of Soviet and the Soviet intentions, especially towards Poland head on, uh, almost before it's, you know, too late. And uh, so Harriman has, you know, a couple of meetings, especially with FDR uh, in the, the fall of 1944, kind of pleading with him to, to take a different stance, and he just doesn't want to do it, uh, which is unfortunate. And so Harriman is uh, powerless to do otherwise unless the president instructs him to. Okay. Um, Jim asks, how did the Soviets use the information that they collected um, against America and Britain from Yalta? Do, do we have any insight into that? Yes. Um, so the Soviets were bugging everyone. They had spies in place you know, well before Yalta. They knew about the Manhattan Project. The Cambridge Five was very active. They had people like Alger Hiss. So they, they had a pretty good sense of what the position of the American and British delegations would be coming into Yalta. They also you know, were bugging everybody's rooms. The Americans did sweep for bugs, but the Soviet technology was better than the American bug sweeping technology, so they didn't get them all. <laughs> Um, so they had kind of a, an eavesdropping team on the, you know, on the grounds, and one of the people in charge of this was the son of the Soviet uh, head of the secret police, Leventry Beria, who was at Yalta. His son was there kind of in the shadows. Nobody knew he was there. So another kind of interesting intergenerational Yalta experience. Um, and he, and so Beria's son suspected sometimes that FDR knew that he was probably being bugged and would say certain things that were indiscreet about Churchill kind of being you know, backwards thinking, kind of trying to signal to Stalin that he was willing to break with Churchill in certain areas to work with him. Oh, okay. Um, so that's one of the ways that you can see their espionage and manipulation. Um, but they also had kind of some of the old school styles of manipulation. Uh, Harriman had a meeting with a, a Soviet diplomat in Moscow before the conference and trying to pressure Harriman. He said, implied that Kathleen, his daughter, was having uh, inappropriate relations with uh, unsavory Soviet men, which was not true. <laughs> and Harriman just kind of dismissed it. It was like, yeah, whatever, you know, thank you for the tea service. Um, and then even at the conference, you can see kind of subtle areas of manipulation. Uh, Leventry Beria is a very creepy, horrible person. He was uh, uh, a serial uh, rapist, uh, truly an awful, awful person. And you can see him kind of subtly, you know, in the few encounters he has with the daughters, you know, being kind of an imposing presence uh, to Sarah Churchill, makes some kind of creepy comments to her. Uh, Anna Roosevelt notes during one of Stalin's grand banquets at the conference that he tries to get her drunk. Meanwhile, she's kind of dumping her vodka in the potted plant behind her and refilling it with mineral water. Um, and so it's just these underhanded elements where they're not overtly, you know, pressuring the, the, the world leaders or their daughters in the way that they could uh, a helpless person, uh, one of their own citizens, but right. you can still see the, the subtle nuances that are uh, definitely not appropriate. Interesting. Um, uh, a, a guest asked, um, is the palace available to visit in Yalta? But actually they were at each at different locations, correct? Yes, so the, the conference is taking place at Lavadia Palace, the Tsar's summer home. Um, and this is where the American delegation is staying. Uh, they agreed to have the Americans stay there so it would be easier, more accessible for Roosevelt to attend all of the meetings uh, as he's paralyzed. The British are staying just down the road at Vorontsov Palace, which uh, had once been the home of the Russian ambassador to the UK, uh, which is kind of a, a funny little cultural touch there. But it was another home that had been nationalized in the wake of the Russian Revolution. And Stalin's choice of villa is a little uh, interesting. He's staying, staying at the Courier Villa, which had been the home of the mastermind behind uh, 
the murder of Rasputin. Uh, so if he's trying to send a subtle message there, he certainly succeeds. The uh, palaces today are not especially accessible. Uh, one of them, I believe it's at Correa Villa, actually uh, is, you know, belongs to Putin as the hand of an official government residence. Um, and the Crimea, of course, has been uh, a place that's been very unstable since 2014. Um, there, it's, you can't get there through Ukraine anymore. You can only go through Russia. The State Department advises against it. Uh, I looked into it and it was really, you know, the, the message is if you go, you can go, but you're you know, your at your own risk. If mm -hmm. you get into trouble, we won't help you. Uh, so I would not advise going to visit today. But I did have a friend who in 2013 took a Black Sea cruise and visited uh, Lavadia Palace before all of the unrest <laughs> occurred. And so she had a number of uh, incredible photographs of Lavadia as it is today, which is really stunning to see uh, the cypress trees. And it seems very much kind of like the Italian Mediterranean sort of coast. Um, and yet, you know, here it is, you know, right on the Black Sea. So it's a place that I hope to go someday, uh, maybe as part of a, an official delegation. Uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, another question came in. Um, we talked about all the other, um, we've talked about all the women with British, um, American, and, uh, but, but not Stalin. Did I, I know Stalin had a daughter, but um, do you want to talk a bit? Sure. Um, so Stalin did have a daughter. Her name is Svetlana, and she was 19 years old at the time of Yalta. Um, she did speak English, so she could have been very valuable to Stalin, uh, like the other daughter diplomats. However, Stalin did not allow his daughter to interact with foreigners. Uh, he, Churchill met Svetlana one time in 1942 when he met Stalin in Moscow, and Stalin kind of brought Svetlana out at dinner time like a prop, as if to say, like, see, I'm a family man too, which is very odd. Um, and Svetlana, she was a redhead like Sarah Churchill. And so after this meeting, um, Svetlana sent a brooch to Sarah as a, a daughter to daughter kind of gift, which was very nice. And Svetlana, and Sarah wore this brooch from Svetlana on her uniform during the duration of the conference. However, Stalin never would have considered bringing Svetlana. Um, they had a very bad relationship at this point. Uh, Svetlana had learned as a teenager that her mother had committed suicide and was driven to it by Stalin holds him responsible and rightly so. And so she rebels as a 15 or 16 year old and falls in love with a uh, Soviet uh, uh, married uh, cinematographer. Uh, he's also Jewish, which Stalin takes issue with, um, sends this man to, the Siber to Siberia. Uh, she rebels again at age 19, falls in love with and marries her classmate, Grigory Morozov, who is also Jewish. And Stalin again takes exception and refuses to meet his son-in-law. So. Uh, Svetlana it has uh, recently married Morozov and is pregnant with their first child at the time of Yalta and relationships between the relations between she and her father are not warm and friendly. Uh, and after he dies, she defects to the United States, uh, which is a very interesting story. She had a, a troubled life, really never found a place where she was happy. And how, I mean, how could you as Stalin's daughter? But there's a lovely novel uh, kind of imagining Svetlana's life in the United States written by John Burnham Schwartz, which came out last year called The Red Daughter, which is uh, an interesting take on what it might be like to be Svetlana, if, if anyone's interested. Interesting, interesting. Um, one person asked, uh, what was your favorite piece of research that you found while, while doing this? Oh gosh. Archival research is really a treasure hunt. You never know what you're going to find when you go in there. The things that you expect to be the most useful sometimes aren't useful at all. And then something that just at the last minute you decide, oh, I might take a peek at that. <laughs> really fascinating. Um, so, you know, there are things that survive like menus from the conference, uh, film footage, which people don't see, kind of the B real, you know, background. Uh, material. There was actually a, a photograph that I thought was fascinating, which I had never seen before. Um, so I showed you the, the famous picture of Yalta a moment ago. Um, but there's another one that was taken of the exact same scene, but from a slightly different angle. And you can actually see the daughters in the picture uh, off to the side. And so you, there's that famous picture of Yalta. And here you can see Sarah and Kathleen in the background. And they'd kind of been there all along, uh, just out of the, the frame of the famous picture. Um, that one. And uh, Anna's just out, outside of this frame, but you can see her on the foot, newsreel footage. And it's just what a different picture we might have of Yalta if this was the one that made it into our textbooks instead of the one that we all know. Um, mm -hmm. 
So that, that was great. The 30 page letter uh, from Peter Portal to Pamela, I loved, that was fascinating. And then also certain things that were written immediately after Yalta, I found really interesting, um, such as uh, a piece by Whitaker Chambers, uh, who had been the person who had been Elder Hiss's Soviet handler, uh, and then decided to have a change of heart, tried to turn Hiss in to the State Department, became a journalist and an anti-communist, and he wrote a piece called The Ghosts on the Roof, uh, imagining looking down at Yalta as if you were the ghost of Tsar Nicholas II, uh, which was such an interesting piece of writing, which I highly recommend people take a look at. Look at. Wonderful. Well, we are wrapping up on our about our hour here. Um, one last last question we can talk about is Gerald Ford becomes president in a post Yalta world. Do you want to talk a bit about um, you know how at the the back end of the conference and and how that works? Sure. Um, so I uh, I do know of one uh, encounter Gerald Ford had uh, with Churchill. Uh, in a sense, he had heard Churchill when he came to address a joint session of Congress in January of 1952. Of course, he was in the Navy when Churchill came uh, twice uh, during the war to address Congress, and he said uh, to his constituents when he returned home to Michigan, reflecting on on the occasion, uh, somehow one feels a greater strength in the British government with Winston Churchill at the helm, uh, which I thought was uh, lovely. Again, thinking of the the uh, Iron Curtain speech anniversary, which is tomorrow, and that's certainly you know, one of the legacies of Yalta. You have. People you know, coming back from the conference, Churchill FDR signaling with all this positivity that it has been a great success, that the Soviets will keep their word. Uh, and however, this is really not reflective of how Churchill especially feels inside. And he confesses to Sarah, uh, he has never felt more anxiety you know, about the future of the world than he does at that moment. So again, kind of putting some separation between public signaling and private opinion, which you can see through the daughter's eyes. Um, of course, Yalta, as we know it today, you know, it's you know not that the heights of success and the high water mark of the Allied relationship, but really the beginning of the end. Um, the Cold War breaks out and all along after Roosevelt dies. Maybe it would have been different if Roosevelt and Stalin had been able to have you know that that personal bond that Roosevelt imagined. Truman, of course, much more of a hardliner against the Soviets. But uh, one of the the successes of the Yalta, if, if perhaps the only success was the founding of the UN. And of course, uh, another uh, son of a great son of Michigan, uh, Senator Arthur Vandenberg was uh, a one-time FDR opponent, but becomes a great advocate for the United Nations and is one of the first delegates there at the, the conference in May of 1945. Um, so that the international spirit, which is really born out of, out of the conference. Um, but I think, you know, we look back on Yalta today and kind of see it as that moment, the world tipped from the, the relationships defined by the by World War to the relationships defined by the Cold War. And that's something that would exist certainly through the, the Ford presidency and beyond. But for it to have turned out any differently, people like to go down kind of a very unsatisfying counterfactual spiral of Yalta. If only FDR hadn't been so sick, maybe he would have been able to stand up to Stalin more. Um, but for things to really have been different, you know, the Soviet Union had a firm foothold in the, in the Eastern Front that would have meant that we would have had to open the Western Front maybe a year earlier, which would have meant we all would have had to have you know rearmed a year earlier. So you know, it's kind of frustrating to to you know, unsatisfying to, to go down that that rabbit hole. Um, but I think that you know even by the 1970s there was this sense that Yalta was similar to Munich, kind of in this case a sellout to the East, um, mm -hmm. and that was really the, the frame of mind that existed through the Cold War. Um, but I think that the takeaways from Yalta are much more nuanced than that, and perhaps some surprising things. Um, questions about how involved should a, a the adult first children of a president be involved in in policy? Um, can you really form a personal bond with the Soviet leader? And maybe Reagan's the only one who really was able to to do that you know, with Gorbachev, who just turned ninety years old. Um, and uh, but largely, you know, that kind of person to person relationship doesn't work the way it might with another elected leader um, from a different country. You've seen recent administrations struggle with what FDR struggled with, you know, the Bush administration, Obama administration, Trump administration, all, you know, did not have a breakthrough in relations with Russia on the basis of a personal friendship uh, with Putin. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, you know, thinking about, you know, institutions like the United Nations, which have been such a success. And the desire that Churchill and Roosevelt had to meet with Stalin in person and how important it was to have that in-person diplomacy. 
And, you know, of course, it's wonderful. We have the tools to be able to talk to you, you know, all around the world uh, on Zoom while we're all at home. But also thinking about that legacy of the importance of in-person diplomacy, both going to a place like Russia, where how it seems on the surface isn't how it is, you know, just beneath, or to have venues like the United Nations where people from all around the world can come together and, and to discuss and have expedited diplomacy and get to know each other on a personal basis. And I think that you know that's a legacy of Yalta as well. You know, as soon as we can get back to in-person diplomacy, you know, the sooner the better. I agree. I agree. Um, and and like we we were talking beforehand, for researchers like you, opening up archives again, um, opening up the resources so that we can move forward and and find new new stories to tell. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, I see just a, a couple of quick yep. questions that popped into the Q and A, which I can just answer super quickly. Um, the name of the ghost article, it's called The Ghosts on the Roof uh, by Whitaker Chambers. Um, I can write that into the chat um, if that's helpful. Um, just typing it. Perfect. And then somebody else very kindly asked about buying the book. Um, I think you guys have a link probably that you can probably I, buy. Yeah, we do. Um, you can buy it locally here in Grand Rapids, obviously at Schuler Books, um, or if it's also on Amazon. So feel free. There'll be, um, I think in our closing slide, we have um, that, that information as well. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for this evening. Um, it was a wonderful refresher course on Yalta. And then a dive into some other personal things going on and and the people who were behind the scenes at Yalta. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun to have a conversation with you this evening. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in, uh, whether you're you know in Michigan or somewhere else in a different part of the world. I'm so glad you're able to, to join. And it's been such a treat getting to know folks uh, all around the world and even hearing from some uh, who've had personal experiences with some of the folks in the book. So if you have, I'd love to hear your stories and uh, you can visit my website, katherinegracecats.com and send me a message. And if you have stories, I'd love to hear them. And um, Jim, I, there is probably a local bookstore in an arbor that also sells them. Um, if you want to email us after the fact, I can get you the name of that store as well. Um, I just want to say thank you tonight to our friends of Ford. Without your contributions, um, programs like this would not be possible. And if you aren't a member or if you haven't updated your membership, I would like to remind you to do that because in April, we've got some lovely programs coming forward. Um, we have our virtual First Ladies Luncheon. And then we will also be hosting a program with General Jim Mattis, um, a virtual program, book talk on his book, Call Sign Chaos. Um, we don't want you to miss out on any of those things. Thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Have a good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Good night. Thanks, Catherine. Bye-bye.